Okay, please, Luis. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you, Marta, and good morning, everybody. Um, as, as Marta just said, uh, today we will have uh, three presentations showing you uh, some of the research we conduct in, um, in the Polytechnic of Tomar uh, from the center in Massau. And um, I hope that in the end, if you have some questions, you'll be free to also raise some. So I, I will try to save time for that. Uh, the focus uh, of my talk is a passage grave. You can see it in the photos. Uh, the passage grave of Val uh, This is a, a monument that uh, we started excavating over 20 years ago. Uh, and then we resumed excavations some uh, three or four years ago again. Uh, it's a, a very important monument uh, sitting in the Zezer Valley. Uh, the, the Zezer Valley is uh, a tributary of the Tagus Valley. I will show you the maps in, in a minute with some more details. Um, the importance of this monument is uh, not only it was quite well preserved, it has interesting data in many respects, not only in terms of uh, human occupations, but also in terms of uh, global landscape transformations, including possible seismic activities in prehistoric times. Uh, but it is important because it was from this moment, monument, that we started um, asking ourselves um, uh, over 20 years ago, actually, about the process of militization uh, in the western uh, facade of the Iberian Peninsula and on the, the mechanisms of spread of farming uh, and herding into this part uh, of the peninsula. Uh, maybe I should say a few words about uh, megaliths first. And um, this is probably important uh, for particularly those of you who are not from Europe, to understand how the process of landscape transformation occurred um, in post-glacial times. What we know uh, from um, um, studying contexts from the Mesolithic, from late hunter-gatherers um, in Atlantic Europe and in the western part of the Mediterranean, is that from those moments, particularly in the Atlantic facade, you start having, uh, in terms of uh, ritual behavior, uh, occasionally the erection of standing stones, isolated standing stones, many years. Uh, and these monuments are the first, uh, one of the two first important features that mark the landscape. The other one, which is actually older, is the building of mounds uh, made of shells, shell middens, as I believe now all of you will know about. Uh, these Chalmedans in the Mesolithic of Ev, uh, of course, uh, a functional purpose also, but they were the first big transformation in terms of marking the landscape. There are mounds, and this idea of building a mound, of, of, of constructing uh, a mound in the landscape is something that starts actually with, with the, the late hunter-gatherers. And then it builds on with some of the farming communities. This is an important element for you to keep in mind. I will come back to it uh, in a while. Uh, what is important is that we understand that more or less from 6,000, uh, between 6,000 and 4,000 BC, uh, more and more features of this type uh, start being spread across the landscapes. Uh, and by 4000 BC, we could say that all the Atlantic facade of Europe was dominated by this type of constructions. They are, they are different. They, they, are, they are passage graves, which are chambers with a passage, uh, sometimes covered by a mound, other times not exactly. Um, we have circles of standing stones. We call them cromlechs. We have... Uh, sequences, lines of standing stones, uh, alignments. Uh, we have, we keep on having isolated standing stones, and at some stage, we will start having uh, not necessarily erected structures, but uh, rock cut structures that replicate the same typology, uh, rock cut 
uh, rock cut tombs uh, that will be found um, uh, also in the western facade, particularly in the Iberian Peninsula, and also some constructions made of smaller stones, uh, what we call uh, toloi, which are actually typologically very similar from uh, constructions in the East Mediterranean, but they, are, they have a different functional purpose. All these structures, all of them, have a ritual dimension, um, which we don't know exactly how it works, but, but they have it. Some, some of them are uh, also um, reinforced, if you wish, uh, by adding uh, art to it, so sometimes carving, sometimes painting, sometimes both. Um, the older features, the isolated standing stones, most of the times when they were excavated, they occur uh, with, uh, associated to grinding uh, st uh, uh, artifacts. Still with hunter-gatherers that would pr process cereals particularly, uh, using grinding stones in, in that context. And uh, some of these earliest uh, many years in uh, Iberia, when they were excavated, uh, archaeological uh, archaeologists found uh, in, the, in the bed uh, where the standing stone was erected, f a fragmented grinding uh, mill, uh, which uh, demonstrates the strong connection between these stones and the in beginnings of uh, a, a in intensification of the exploitation of uh, what will become uh, later agricultural resources, but in the first stage were simply uh, collected uh, vegetation uh, cereal resources. Um, so we, we have this diversity and um, at some stage, an, a, a growing number of the features, the so-called dolmens or passage graves, and also the toilet, are associated to burials. So not all megaliths are associated to burials. Cromlechs are not, for example. Alignments are not, even if they might have in the nearby uh, context some uh, burials. And um, so we understand the megalithic phenomenon as going beyond bearing. It's more than that. It's about understanding and defining the landscape. You, you can see in the small map the spread of megaliths, uh, which have different chronologies, actually. But you, you can see how, how extensive is their uh, dissemination. But I would uh, point to you, I don't know if you can see the harrow, when I use it, but in any case, if you look at the Iberian Peninsula, you will see a big void, a big white uh, space in the Iberian Peninsula. And this is an important indication, because if I tell you that particularly the coastal area um, of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, close to Catalonia and, and Valencia, are uh, is the area where the first Neolithic uh, sailors um, came to Iber the Iberian Peninsula uh, in, in later prehistoric times, uh, you, you, you will understand my argument in a few minutes about how these initial uh, megalithic contexts relate to the spread of farming. Now, uh, uh, Brief word about the, the physical setting. Uh, you can see here a schematic representation of the geomorphology of the Iberian Peninsula, and then a, a more detailed uh, approach to the area uh, where uh, that we call the, the Portuguese Middle Tagus or the Northern Riva Tejo. It's an area where three, uh, you, you can see here the, 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 the biggest uh, river in, in the Iberian Peninsula, the, the Tagus River that flows from Spain and up to Lisbon. It normally runs east-west and then it bends to southwest uh, in, 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 a, in, in this place here, which is the area of 
entroncamento in the Vila Nova da Barquinha. I, I say the names because those of you who are or will be in uh, uh, Portugal will will visit this, these areas. And um, uh, this is because the river, after cutting across the schist uh, 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 formations, which also have some quartzite and some granitic uh, um, uh, components, uh, meets the limestone uh, ridge and is forced to, to, to go south, in, uh, uh, digging a big detritic basin, the, the, the basin of the Tagus. So when you look at this second middle part of the, the map, uh, what you see in blue is uh, basically limestones with different chronologies, the darker blue being the harder, the, the darker uh, Jurassic uh, um, formations. What you see in uh, um, green to the right uh, uh, and also pink are uh, uh, and, and, um, the schists and also the granites. And then what you see uh, yellowish uh, is the detritic basin uh, uh, dug uh, ma mainly throughout the quaternary. Uh, and that's where you will find also a lot of Paleolithic occupations, which is not the topic of, of the talk this morning. And here you, you will see um, um, an, a, a first image of the, of the monument that actually was also in the first slide. Uh, if in this in this map you see here this is the the, the Tagus the the, the Zezer River runs here and the the, the the passage grave is in the in the margin of the Zezer River um i will try to go uh, to guide you through the process of our own research for you to understand how how the reasoning was as far as I can remember it, uh, because uh, this was, uh, as I say, uh, done uh, in, in, in the first half of the 1990s. Actually, it started, the, the excavation started in 1989. By, by the time, the understanding of the Neolithic in uh, the Iberian Peninsula was still pretty much the same as we understand uh, most of the spread of farming into the West Mediterranean meaning that uh, we have strong evidence that the first uh, farming communities in the western iberia uh, sorry in the western mediterranean were initially coastal they were close to to, to the to, to the, the shoreline uh, occupying often the light soils uh, in limestone formations close to the coast why the light stones uh, uh, soils because the, the the soils that are, are very heavy uh, clay soils are richer in terms of nutrients for farming but they require um, heavy tools mainly metallic tools that will allow plowing them uh, inversely the, the soils that are associated to for example uh, limestones uh, bedrocks, they are lighter, they, they, they have a stronger component in silt and, and in sands. They are not as good in terms of nutrients, but they are easier to plow. And so um, first farmers preferred this type of, of soils uh, when they were occupying the landscape. So what, what we see in southern France, in uh, in the eastern coast of the Iberian Peninsula, also in the western coast, all, all, all around the Iberian Peninsula, is the establishment of early uh, small uh, groups uh, who, who would um, potentially prefer this, those type of soils, even if in, in the, in the West Iber western Iberian Peninsula we don't have evidence of farming uh, we only have evidence of herding in the initial stages. But in any case, they prefer that, those type of soils. So the idea, the dominant idea uh, by the late 1980s and, and even through the, the 1990s was that the, the same model would apply to the, uh, to the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, there were two sites that started uh, uh, raising uh, some doubts about 
how the process was occurring in, in the western facade of, of the peninsula. The first one came actually from a cave, uh, the cave of Cadaval, which was excavated in the 1980s and that we resumed excavating two years ago. Um, this, um, this was important to better refine the understanding of the Neolithic in what we can call today the caves tradition or the shoreline tradition or the limestone tradition, if you wish, uh, which uh, is directly connected to this uh, spread of farmers across the shores of the Mediterranean. And who were those farmers? All of you know now, uh, they were uh, using uh, the, what we know as being the, the Neolithic package, polished stone axe, uh, beads, uh, some uh, bone elements, and particularly a kind of pottery decoration that we know uh, uh, by the name of cardi uh, cardio pottery, uh, decora uh, decorated with uh, shells of uh, uh, cardio medulle, uh, a, sh uh, a shell collected in, in, in the sea. This, um, the, the finding of this uh, passage grave, we knew for a long time, of course, that uh, the Iberian Peninsula is, the Western Iberian Peninsula, is the largest concentration of passage graves in Europe. Um, there are other in, very important uh, areas of megaliths, particularly France, but the, in, in terms of absolute numbers of monuments, uh, the West Iberian Peninsula is the biggest concentration, uh, and Portugal has over two thirds of those of those monuments. Uh, uh, in terms of chronology, what was already known also by the 1990s was that the oldest chronologies for this type of constructions are to be found in the Iberian Peninsula, in in, in southern Portugal, and also in the Netherlands as uh, strange as the, this may seem, but um, the, the dates that are in between in, in, uh, in France, in northern Spain, in uh, Ireland, are chronologically uh, uh, more recent, late, later than these two initial uh, stages. These, these were the things we already knew. What we were surprised uh, when f excavating this monument was, well, it was a very well-preserved monument, and in terms of structure, the, uh, the initial observation of the structure um, was not so surprising. It, it's, it's a monument with a chamber made of five uh, big uh, standing stones, uh, the caps, uh, a capstone uh, that was broken, and then a small passage which uh, was lower than the chamber, the, 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 and, and this, this small passage had also two standing stones, two orthostites on each side, and it was covered. Um, the monument being also interesting because it had some features associated uh, in the entrance. You can see in the middle of the slides, uh, the initial reconstructions, these were, these were made by um, 1994, or 93 or 94, and um, at the time we had recognized that the monument had an external circle of stones, you, you can see in the drawing. We understood that it had a curb, and, and a curb is, a, is what you can see here in the drawing, and also on, on your right side, uh, you, you can see a detail of the reconstructed part of the, of the curb. Uh, but this the, this is reconstructing reconstructed simply putting back the small slabs upright. They, they they are exactly where they were found. They were simply put upright because they had fallen. Um, we in order to do this work, we actually did a lot of experimental archaeology to understand the process of uh, decomposition, if you wish, of the mound through the erosion and through the impact of the weight of 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 the the stones in the mound themselves uh, the the monument was also interesting in in terms of the techniques of construction um we we saw that there was a strategy to to have a, a minimum effort in terms of uh, um, 
the energy input to build it. The, the back of the monument was uh, built against uh, an irregularity of the outcrop so that the mound would look like, as you see it here, we, we still discuss if it was completely covered or not, but in this reconstruction, we did the, the reconstruction with the, with the full covering, but the, the bedrock in, in the back of the chamber was actually um, doing already part of, of, of the slope of the mound. So the energy to carry uh, stones and earth to do the mound was only very important in, in the, the front part of the monument. Uh, in ritual terms, we also understood some complexities that were less preserved in other monuments uh, in the Iberian Peninsula, but after Valdalage was discovered and excavated, more and more of these features have been noticed, and largely because, uh, of course, a bibliographic reference was there to look better into these details. The chamber has roughly two and a half meters diameter, uh, and then there is um, a first circle of stones, uh, which distance two and uh, two and a half meters from the chamber and from the, the passage. And then there are ramparts, which were clearly used on one hand, hand to sustain the upright stones, but also to help putting the capstones on the top. But they are not constructed all over, only in some parts. Uh, and then the wall was covered with soil. And and now I enter an important thing that surprised us. When we we went down excavating, we understood that what we were observing was not necessarily the original uh construction of, of 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 the structure it was something added in a later period added after 4000 bc during the calcolithic occupation that there was an initial neolithic stage and in this initial neolithic stage we have today strong doubts here in the reconstructions of the 1990s we thought that there was an earthen mound this earthen mound would be eroded after more than 1,000 years, and then it would have been reconstructed in the Calcolithic as you see it here. And this is how it looks like now, uh, with, with a mound of earth covered with stones. And uh, so it's not a stone mound, as sometimes occurs in megaliths, uh, with what uh, we call in the literature the, ca the, the cairns, a stone mound. It's a earthen mound, much easier to construct, but looking like a cairn, looking like a, a stone mound, because on the top, the builders added small stones just to make uh, an appearance of being a stone mound. So you have here a, a complex mo monument, and our interest from the moment we understood there was an initial stage concentrated in this initial stage. We wanted to know more about it. Here you can see a section of, of, of the monument and uh, the two main uh, uh, layers. There was what we called a layer A, and this layer A was the topsoil with uh, um, a bronze, uh, bronze Age occupation, an early Bronze Age occupation, which was actually done in the mound, and it's a later thing. We have the B, which is the calcolithic layer, and it's in this B layer that you have the, the, the building of the curb with the small standing stones, you have the, the, the building of the mound covered with stones as well, and you have the addings of external features like the round one that you saw and another one that we found that we discovered later. But you have this C layer, and, and, and this C layer in the beginning, we thought it was uh, not occupied, but then we understood it had also um, uh, artifacts and it was associated to burials in, in an initial stage. You can also not very well see, I imagine, on your side, but you, you can see in, the, in this section, this is a magnification of, the, of this part of the section, you see here stones 
on top of sea. These zones are actually a sort of courtyard, uh, which in the reconstruction you have here. In the Calcolithic, one of the added features was a, a courtyard made of small stones, uh, probably for ceremonies associated to, to the burials. Unfortunately, uh, the, mo the monument has uh, uh, had no bones because we are see it's it's a, a gneiss construction. The, the wall area is dominated by gneiss and granites. Uh, the soils are very very acidic, uh, and therefore we we were unable to retrieve bones. There, there were only for the Bronze Age, there were, there were two fragments of bones, but only in the Bronze Age. But for the main occupations, there, there were no bones. We, we estimate, nevertheless, that the, 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 the occupation was very uh, uh, intense and that uh, about 100 individuals, at least, were buried there in, in of course, different moments. Now, about the lithics. Uh, this slide, the, 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 the number, when I say around 100 uh, people buried, it's because um, most of the artifacts, and particularly the ceramics, but, but also the lithics, are counted in numbers that go close to uh, around 90, if you wish, around 90. So, so if we think that people were buried with a, a kit of tools, maybe uh, the this this could correspond to the number of buried people and uh, we do this estimation because in other places um, where bones were preserved uh, often the, the buried people were uh, buried with a, 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 a small kit of of tools including uh, uh, a, a pot an arrowhead or, or uh, an arrow probably and uh, a polished stone axe or uh, some other features like microliths and so on. The artifacts you see, uh, I raise your attention to the top left. Uh, when we first found this monument, which also for this purpose became important for the study of the Neolithic in Portugal, we found these uh, choppers, if you wish, um, and we thought that the, 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 the passage grade had been built on top of uh, a Paleolithic uh, site, or at least remains of Paleolithic occupation. But this was not the case. Later studies demonstrated that uh, all through the Holocene and until the early Bronze Age, the use of heavy duty tools, which are typologically very similar to what we have in, in the Paleolithic, actually in, in, in the lower Paleolithic, but in fact, they are expedient use of uh, uh, local raw material to produce, uh, as I said, heavy duty tools alongside the use of flint for uh, making seagulls, arrows, and uh, other sorts of uh, uh, Neolithic artifacts. So we understood from Valdelage that this was possibly something different. When we look at the initial layer, this C layer that I showed you before, the C layer, layer has this type of, of artifacts, also microliths, as you can see here in the, in the uh, particularly trapeze and triangles, and some uh, ceramics as well. The ceramics being of very poor quality, but uh, it's, it's still present. So we understand that first erection of this passage grave was made by people that were not using most of the artifacts that characterize the later occupations. So when you see this slide, for example, you don't have arrowheads in the first layer. You um, have fragments of polished stone, but these two that you can see are, are from the Calcolithic. The, the, the initial ones are broken broken uh, fragments of a polished stone axe, but we understand they had polished stone axes anyway. And the majority of the lithics is actually of this type of heavy duty tools. Uh, we know also from other monuments in Portugal that uh, many of these mon monuments have very few, sometimes no artifacts at all. Uh, so 
it is not a surprise that the, the, this foundation layer has very few artifacts. And this became important actually for us to go back to the Tagus Valley, which is uh, the big valley to which the, the Zezer is a tributary. The Val d'Alage sits more or less three kilometers from, from the Tagus. And uh, in the Tagus Valley, we have, after Val d'Alage, reassessed systematically the sites associated to quaternary terraces. And uh, after a few years of work, we could uh, finally uh, identify a methodology to separate the uh, Holocenic from the Paleolithic uh, um, uh, context. And this was, well, on one hand, of course, using stratigraphy, but also uh, being able to understand the technological differences between the producing of some of these artifacts versus the Paleolithic ones. And there's a study, for those interested, I can then uh, send, done by a, a colleague of ours, uh, uh, Sara Kure, with, uh, with uh, the collaboration of, of various other colleagues, in, including um, some from Italy. Now, here in this slide, you have um, uh, the drawings of the almost 100 uh, pots from the main um, level of occupation. This explains, to a large extent, why this monument was also so important. So it's very important in terms of uh, architecture. It allowed us to understand better the archetypes and uh, uh, how how this notion of building a passage grave was occurring in, in, in Western Iberia. Uh, but it also allowed us to connect with a series of ceramics. And when we started studying these ceramics, we identified actually in, in by, by the mid-1990s that uh, we had this around uh, 100 pots. Uh, most of them over 90 in the calcolithic layer and then a few uh, in the lower neolithic layer these uh, these ones being typologically similar but of a poor quality and as you can see here you have bowls you have uh, cups you have pots you you you, you have uh, different typologies and uh, um, we tried uh, in, in various ways to uh, uh, try to understand if there was a chronological sequence, uh, both of these and also of the lithics within the, the, the calcolithic layer, um, but we could not. Um, but still we understood, and uh, as all the other studies in the new, on the Neolithic uh, considered, that the, the typological diversity of the pots uh, would correspond to different functions. So they would potentially uh, include uh, different types of uh, things inside, probably food, but at the time we, we did not know. Uh, one of the works we did systematically here with the Val d'Alage was actually to, to do experimental archaeology. I already mentioned about uh, the mound itself, we, we, we did that, but also with artifacts trying to reproduce, we did with ceramics, for example, here in the bottom you see the, pro uh, on the left, you see an original uh, lamp, it's uh, uh, a lamp uh, that um, we, we, identi we, we excavated from the passage. And then the attempt to reproduce it, and this is a replica. And uh, we use this to understand the process of, of fabrics. For example, one, one of the things that became interesting in this experimentation was that um, we understood the function of some of the heavy duty tools that we had found in Neolithic contexts. Part of the residues of these were found incorporated as non-plastic elements to uh, in the process of making the pots. So there is a, 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 an operational chain, if you wish, that uh, is not uh, is combining 
the production of the lithic tools and the production of the ceramics and this was particularly interesting in terms of understanding the processes of fabrication of tools in the region the site was also important for environmental studies although here of course we had to rely largely on data also from other sites and also from particularly from uh, cores uh, in the in the Tagus Valley but one interesting indicator that's the only thing um, I want to stress or is that uh, what what we know from this transition between the the six or even the seventh to the third millennium BC is that while well, in environmental uh, terms there is a degradation of the forest, of the initial uh, bushes, <clears throat> which precedes the Neolithic. And this is a, an important indicator. So against evidences in other parts of Europe and even of the Iberian Peninsula, um, the, um, the clearing um, of, of, of the land in terms of a decay of tr trees coverage and replacement by a more shrub type of vegetation is something that occurs very early uh, in, in the process. It, it, so it, it is not clearly in this case re, uh, related to the entropic uh, uh, process of uh, farming, of clearing for farming. So first Neolithic people arriving in this area found already a cleared landscape. We, we have indications of uh, domestication of uh, not in Val d'Alage but in the region of uh, pig, goat um, and also uh, cattle and uh, one interesting thing we, we obtain in terms of information more recently in the PhD done uh, in the quaternary prehistory PhD uh, some years ago by uh, Darko Stoyanovsky was that against everyone's and our expectations the pots the ceramics could not be related to different uh, products all of them had indications of a strong um, uh, use of dairy um, products uh, so milk and related um, in, 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 in the, both in the Neolithic and the Chalcolithic, there would be no difference in that respect. And also um, uh, the fact that you could not separate uh, uh, shapes, morphologies of, of the ceramics versus what they were containing. And this is, of course, an interesting information uh, that so far can, could not be tested in other, uh, in other sites. The, the fact is that Valdalash preserved uh, in an almost unique way, the, the fat, the lipids uh, from, uh, the, that were uh, uh, resulting from the products that were put in those spots. Now, uh, let me go very briefly showing you some of the other monuments in the region. Across the valley, um, you have uh, uh, interesting features like this one. This is a natural uh, structure, uh, but it would look like being uh, a passage grave and it was actually used as a burying structure. It's uh, part of a necropolis of various megalithic monuments, but in this case, with very similar artifacts and with a very well dated context around um, 6,000 uh, years, you have uh, bur burials of individuals uh, with, as I said, basically the same chronology, but with a completely different typology. Here is uh, another passage grave uh, uh, closer to the Tagus, uh, and you can see more or less the same logic, the chamber, but you can see that the number of slabs in the chamber is larger, and the corridor is also uh, first longer and also made of smaller stones. These uh, passages with more slabs are normally later. The oldest passage graves in Portugal have only five slabs, and that's the case of Faldalash. 
Here you have another monument, which is uh, in Massão, Anta do Rio Frio. And this is a monument overlooking the Tagus Valley. You can see here the aerial uh, views of it. And uh, in these other monuments I'm showing you, there is no evidence of this initial uh, older layer. This is Anta do Laginha, also in Massão. Uh, you have the photo and also the drawing. Again, a monument made of eight slabs in this case. Uh, uh, here in this drawing is a small corridor, but actually it was a much longer symbolic passage. Uh, symbolic because in the end it's made of very small stones, um, not uh, bigger than 20 centimeters. So it's only marking, and this is, for example, a passage grave which was left uncovered, as many others. Um, in any case, um, it, it, is, it shows, I'm showing you these monuments to show you that the diversity of the constructions, despite the appearance of all being megalithic, is very big. Here you have Condo Ribeiro, it's in Provença. It's always still the same region. And here you can see how long this passage is. And this is a reconstruction made by the college. This is not one of our excavations. The lower line is what they found. The top line is how they think was the mound in the beginning. But after the excavation of some of these monuments, uh, and namely La Ginha that I showed you uh, just before, uh, some of us more and more think that many of these initial passage graves were not completely covered. So um, the, this, this remains to be discussed. A bit up north, in still in the Zezer Valley, but in the limestone area of the Zezer Valley, you have a later uh, set of constructions from the Calcolithic. Here you have a, a roundish structures, again with uh, eight or nine slabs and a small passage. Um, this one was also interesting in terms of measurements. We found uh, in the bottom of the, of the monument small stones making the design of the monument. So, uh, uh, at least in this case, it seems that uh, prehistoric people spread a few stones just to make the contour of the monument. And that, and then, like, like if you would draw in the floor the plan before putting the, the, the stones upright. Uh, here you have a, a just um, 50 meters beside, with the same chronology, always calcolytic, you have what is looks almost like a square uh, with with a narrow passage uh, monument, very hot, odd megalithic construction. So the diversity is very big. It's the, uh, in terms of architecture, but then when you look at the artifacts, they're all very similar. In the region, uh, uh, we we are getting to, to to time, so I have to to speed up, uh, but. In the region, of course, we have other types of uh, contexts with burials, and caves are very important in this. Um, in caves, we have bones, and we understood that the uh, well, the uh, uh, typological uh, assemblages in terms of artifacts was in the earliest stages very different from uh, what. Uh, we could find in uh, in the passage graves, and particularly in Valdelage and the other ones that I showed you. This uh, combined with the assessment of other features, like for example, the settlements. We we have very few settlements in the region. To be well, we only have three sites that can clearly be considered uh, Neolithic habitat sites. Uh, one of them is probably a long house and this is again interesting because um, you will find in the literature that uh, in most literature that uh, the spread of neolithic uh, across the mediterranean was made basically with villages with round houses whereas the uh, spread to the northern european plains from the net then through the danube uh, valley was accompanied by longhouses, rectangular longhouses, as you can see in the picture here. However, we started finding, finding a few longhouses in Iberia, in Catalonia, also in the Algarve, and uh, we have one 
uh, in this region, in the Tagus Valley. We have then uh, two other sites um, of habitat, one of which has remains of a hut, and in that case, it's a round hut. So, in a sense, we are a bit puzzled to date about uh, what was really happening in detail. Um, on, nevertheless, we understand something, uh, is that the builders of the megalithic monuments are not the same people that were using the occupying the caves and uh, bringing in the uh, cardinal pottery and so on in the beginning the buildings builders of of megaliths spread from the inland to the coast and not the other way around and uh, Alongside the construction of, of the megaliths, which is the most prominent feature that we can see in the landscape, they, they are probably connected with the earliest groups that carved rock art in the big valleys of the West, particularly the Tagus Valley and its, well, its tributaries, like the Ocreza and others, uh, but the Tagus Valley itself, and the Guadiana uh, Valley which is the valley that separates the southern part of Portugal and Spain, to put it in simple terms, which <clears throat> is also packed with rock art. We uh, can establish a chronological and a spatial relation between the rock art and the earliest megaliths, although we never found uh, in these initial stages rock art uh, of the with that typology in the megaliths. But that doesn't mean they were not related because they serve different functions. So in terms of stratigraphies and in terms of, of uh, um, let's say, uh, spread in the landscape, they, they, they overlap. Uh, so looking at the traditions here in this slide, you have what is the tradition of ceramics uh, in the caves, so you can see bigger uh, pots, often heavily decorated with cardium uh, decorations or similar related to that, whereas the ceramics from the megaliths resemble normally what you can see in the bottom, but particularly with what I showed you before in the other slide. We also see a difference in the lithic traditions. The, um, the polished stone axe and the diversity of lithic uh, flint implements, it's much larger in the, in the limestone area. Uh, the polished stone axes are very different. Here you can see what uh, on the left, what we found in the bottom left uh, in caves. They are exquisite artifacts, completely polished, uh, very refined, and they contrast with what I showed you before, and also what you can see here on the top, in the middle, but in the top, uh, which when where only the edge is polished, the rest is left, uh, um, let's say, only just uh, defined in terms of shape. We have in the in the passage graves decorated elements, symbolic elements like um, slate plaques, which we don't find in caves unless in very later moments. And this allowed us to understand that there are two basic traditions uh, in the region and actually in the Iberian Peninsula. One is related to the cardinal spread, uh, and we find it, its remains in this region in caves, but we find it all along the Portuguese coast from the south, southern Algarve, the Alentejo, and up to the region of Coimbra. Um, and even a bit more, even into the uh, into the Douro level, uh, Valley. And then we have something else, uh, which originally uh, archaeologists thought was a secondary process of occupation of lands inland, of uh, going inside the, the, the peninsula. But looking at the chronologies, we understand now it can't be that. It's about the interaction probably of some of these uh, Neolithic uh, sailors, but that at some stage, instead of 
keeping on moving along the shores, some of them must have went upstream through uh, big valleys in southern Spain, and particularly the, the Guadalquivir Valley, which allows a good... Uh, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't put a map here, but the Guadalquivir, if you know where Cadiz is, so think of Cadiz and going upstream uh, through Cadiz in the direction of Seville and then turn uh, west, you will find the, the, the Guadiana and, and then the Tagus Valleys. And, and this is a, a, a smooth passage if you want to compare it with trying to navigate into the Atlantic waters, which are much more dangerous than the Mediterranean ones. So probably some of the groups not all, but some went uh, uh, through the Iberian Peninsula, through the rivers, and then they interacted with local uh, indigenous populations. This would explain <coughs> why you would have these initial stages where the tradition of the epipaleolithic groups is still very present in terms of the toolkits, and uh, in which the um, most iconic elements of the Neolithic groups, which was the cardial ceramics that you can see on the left of this slide, was abandoned. It's, it's simply not there. Uh, and it's replaced with something else. Uh, and this something else is still connected to the Mediterranean, but it's a different type of, of tradition. So uh, to, to conclude, I, I forgot to say something which is also important. Um, uh, we did lots of studies in this. I had no time to detail about uh, sedimentological analysis and, and others. And one, one of them was um, studying the soils around this, this monument. And uh, we understood uh, many years ago through uh, phosphate analysis that the soils were particularly enriched um, and uh, likely due to the, um, the domestication of cattle. Uh, and this was, of course, an important indication that we tested then in other places, like, for example, um, uh, Jugada, uh, Inca Valada site that I showed you a few minutes ago, the one that I said it's not a passage grave, but it was used as if it was for burials. Now, the soils around these monuments were intensively used we don't know if they were used for farming, we have no evidence of that, but they were used certainly for keeping animals. And uh, in general, looking at megaliths in Portugal, uh, one of the things we know is that they sit in good soils in terms of farming. Uh, and uh, they sit in areas which are different from those where the settlements are which is very interesting. The settlements are normally located in the uh, areas where they would not do agriculture because the soils were either too poor or too hard to work. Uh, uh, but um, so they are somewhere else, whereas the megalith sits in the areas of farming and, if you wish, of economic productivity. Um, I leave you with this last slide. Uh, the, uh, I will not have time to comment because otherwise there's no time for questions. Even now we, we are in the, in, the, in the end. But this is uh, the remains on the right side of the first big village in the late Calcolithic near Tomar. Uh, but that would be another talk. So I will stop now. Uh, I'm sorry I, I spoke too long. But um, Marta, if there is still time, 